So welcome back and I do hope as ever you and your family are keeping well. What we're going to look at in this lesson is superposition of waves and interference. So we're looking at what happens when two progressive wave fronts meet head on and what result you get when the waves overlap. So I'm going to begin by looking at an application of this before I explain it in detail. And I'm going to look at noise cancelling headphones. You may be familiar with these. Um, they're used by people who fly aeroplanes and also who do shooting and things like that. So I'm going to draw uh, what's going to look like a really silly diagram, but just to make the point. So uh, here's a loudspeaker and that loudspeaker is inside the headphones. So I'm going to draw uh, the sort of earpiece of the headphone like that. These are the ones you'd have uh, outside, sort of over your ears, the way I'm drawing it. OK, but it works perfectly uh, well for ones that would sit uh, inside your ears. So um, here's your head. Probably doesn't look anything like you, but there we go. OK, now I appreciate that I've drawn that huge and I haven't necessarily drawn it directly over your ear, but I'm trying to make a point here that um, when you um, listen um, to um, sound in headphones, and I'm thinking particularly of someone who might be uh, flying, they only want to hear uh, the stuff that comes from the electronics, for example, air traffic control. When you're shooting, um, you actually will wear uh, ear protectors, but you want to block out the sound of the shooting uh, and uh, the sort of damaging sounds as much as possible. Now, I'm not going to draw this in terms of changing amplitude, but what I'm suggesting is that some of the sound from the outside could get in. So there's the sound wave making its way in through the headphone. Obviously, the amplitude um, and intensity would reduce. OK, but what would happen if in the headphones we had a, a little microphone? So I'll draw a little microphone there. And that goes to a bit of electronics inside the headphones. And that bit of electronics multiplies that wave by minus one. Uh, what I'm pointing out there is it inverts the wave. OK. So it listens to the wave that hits the headphone body. And it plays that wave back. But it plays it back coming out of the headphones the opposite of what's coming in. So if we've got this uh, trough coming in, what we will play to the ear is a peak. OK. Now, if you can see what I'm doing here, um, to begin with, this seems illogical, that we've got sound coming in from the aircraft engines or from the shooting um, from the gun that we don't want. And what we're doing is we're adding more sound. But look at this for clever. If we always play out of the headphones electronically, the opposite of what gets in acoustically from outside, this peak and that trough will cancel and it should completely remove that sound. It will uh, noise cancel. And so you will lose all the effect of the sound from outside and you'll only hear the sound that you need to hear from your headphones. So, our noise cancelling headphones use an interesting property of waves. They use superposition, the addition of two waves. OK, and I'm going to give you um, the sort of rules uh, for this to happen. OK, so when we uh, get superposition, the uh, two waves meeting head on and adding mathematically, um, there are certain rules that have to apply for us to get this sort of cancelling or addition effect. So we have to have two progressive waves, obviously. Two or more, in fact, but two progressive waves. That's the first thing. Uh, they have to meet at a place in space, in this case, um, at our ear. OK. And this is obvious. They have to be of the same kind of wave. So this isn't going to happen with a light wave and a sound wave. OK. It has to be, in this case, two sound waves. But we could do it with two light waves. OK. 
Uh, they obviously have to pass through each other. Here they look as if they're on top of each other, uh, but we can get the waves meeting head on and then carrying on, passing through each other. Okay. So the waves pass through each other. And when they do that, where they meet, they superpose. Uh, um, it's a kind of a weird word, but they add up. And the final thing is, at a particular point, okay, um, in the case of sound wave, it'll be an oscillating uh, molecule. At that specific point, what happens is, uh, the instantaneous displacement, how far that has moved at any given instant, is the addition of the two waves that meet at that point. Okay, so um, the instantaneous displacement So that's of um, a particular point along the wave fronts is equal to the sum, the addition of individual wave displacements. Now, where did this minus come from? How can we show that it's a peak or a trough? Well, the important thing to remember is displacement. It's often given the letter S in physics. Displacement is a vector quantity. So let me draw you an example of this. So, e.g., we'll show two progressive waves traveling, one from the left and one from the right. So here we go. Here's a wave traveling this way. I'm going to draw just a peak, a pulse like that. And it's going to meet another wave traveling from the opposite direction. The colors here don't matter too much. I'm just trying to, trying to sort of show you which peak is which. So that one is traveling that way and this one is traveling that way. And we'll make that at a time, should we call that time one? Okay. Now, let's wait a few moments, and I think it's pretty obvious, at time two, because they're in the same medium, they will have moved a little bit closer together. So we're now in this situation, but the waves haven't yet met in space. So we're waiting for the situation where they meet head on. So that's time two. And uh, you can guess what's going to happen next. The two peaks are going to um, line up at the same place. So now let's do what happens a little bit later. Now, obviously, my colours go to pieces here, but they're going to meet about there. OK, so uh, where's the purple pen? Here we go. But I hope what you realise is that what you get here is going to be the sum of that one and that one. This is a displacement. Should we call it one centimetre? Should be in metres. This is a displacement. And so we've got one centimetre displacement plus, not minus in this case, because it's not negative, plus another centimeter, so we're going to get a bigger displacement. So we'll get a taller peak. Now, that isn't the end of the story, of course, because what's gonna happen is they're progressive, they're passing through each other. So the one I drew in purple is now gonna continue off to the left, and the one in blue is gonna continue off to the right. So, um, I'll change colour to sort of indicate that, swap round. But a few moments later, there's the purple one heading off that way. And the one I drew in blue. It's continuing 
in the direction it was originally going. And you'll see that they retain their original displacements. It's only when they superpose, only when they meet, that they produce a taller peak. I don't think I've made a very good job of making that peak a lot taller. It should really be the addition um, of those two. But I think you get the idea that this black bit I've drawn here is the addition of these two waves as they pass through each other at this point. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail now, and I'm going to do it graphically. And this is something you need to know how to do at A-level. So I'm going to have a wave traveling in from the left. Here it is. OK, and I'm going to have it peak first. OK, so there's the peak traveling that way, peak first. And it's traveling along, and it's going to meet a wave coming in uh, from the other direction and this one is going to be a bigger amplitude and you'll notice that that wave is trough coming in first so there we go and I'll just remind you that that one's traveling that way and this one is traveling that way now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what happens at a specific point. So remember, we look at the displacement of these two waves when they both reach that point. So I'll put a little point on here, call that P. And what I want to do is I want to draw a graph of what happens to the displacement of this particle P as time ticks away as these two waves pass through each other. So what we've got to do is at every time that we look, we've got to add these two waves together, taking to, into account the displacement, which might be negative. So it's a bit of a devil to draw this one, so I've done it in advance, and you wouldn't be expected to do this, I don't think, at uh, A-level. Uh, but you might be asked to complete the diagram, which is what we're going to do in a second. So what I'm seeing here is the blue wave, OK? And at time naught, it's just about to rise at point P. So the blue wave has just arrived at point P. But it's just about to fall due to the purple wave arriving at point P. And then we keep the stop clock running. And if we only had the blue wave, this is what we'd see the displacement like at P due to the blue wave. And this is what we would see if only the purple wave went that way. Now, you'll notice that they're uh, out of phase with each other. They've got different amplitudes, but they've got the same frequency, which makes life a little bit easier. So if you remember, you get superposition. These two waves superpose at point P. So what you might be asked to draw is... What's the end result? OK, well, at time t equals naught, that bit and that bit arrive, so zero. Then a little bit later, we've got minus two. So we've got, um, if it was water, the water pulled down by two units, but trying to rise by one. So that's the displacement we get, adding those two. Naught and naught, nothing. Uh, plus two and minus one there and then finally naught and naught and then the waves are passed completely point p so you've got um, nothing adding with nothing so the overall effect that you will see the overall displacement at point p will be that and i hope you can see how we added the two displacements from each wave and i hope you can see why the resultant displacement early on is negative and later on, it's positive. So the green bit we've drawn is not a wave as such. It looks like a wave. It is literally what would the water do at point P as these two waves passed through each other. So we've added the two and shown it would drop down first, but not to the um, depth we'd expect. And then it'll rise and then it will be all calm again. So this process of two waves meeting and producing a result, um, resulting um, displacement, so where two progressive waves pass through each other 
Uh, what you see, this addition, is called interference. It's an interference effect. So um, just to sort of um, revise that a little bit further, let's look at two types of interference. And I think you're probably up to speed on this now. So if we had two progressive waves meeting where we got this wave meeting this wave, obviously they'd be going in opposite directions, I think you could see that that peak and that peak add, that trough and that trough add, so we would get more wave, okay? A uh, little mistake that students make, sometimes they think troughs are nothingness, so a trough and a trough would make nothing. No, it's a trough plus an, another trough, so the displacement's going to be even more negative. So the two waves have added together there, they've added in phase, and they've created a much bigger wave, okay? And this type of interference, we call constructive interference. And that happens when one wave is going up and the other one is going up. It doesn't have to be by the same amount, but it means they are in phase. In other words, the phase angle phi between them is zero degrees or zero radians. So let's quickly look at the other type of interference. What happens if this wave meets this wave? Okay, well you'll notice that one is positive and the other one is negative. So if they meet, you get a very interesting effect and you are going to be surprised by this. At all times, if you add the displacement of that to the displacement of that, you will get nothing. Okay, do you remember the noise cancelling headphones? And this is destructive interference. And destructive interference happens uh, to produce uh, no displacement at all if the phase angle between the two waves is 180 degrees out of phase, uh, that's the same as pi radians out of phase, or what we call antiphase. Now, I'll just uh, mention on this one, isn't that interesting? It means you can get two sound waves arrive, two loud sound waves, but if they're out of phase with each other, they will cancel and produce no sound. Maybe that's obvious with the noise cancelling headphones. But, wouldn't that be weird if it was two light beams? So you could shine two laser beams on top of each other, two really bright laser beams, but if the waves arrived, peak and trough, trough and peak, peak and trough, out of phase, those two beams would completely cancel to give no light at all. And I will demonstrate that uh, at some stage, but it's a really, really unusual effect. Now there's one little thing I'd like you to note just before we finish on this bit, that do remember the intensity of a wave, and this is from our previous work, how intense the wave is, is proportional to the amplitude you see squared. Okay, so now we understand about superposition creating interference. Let's see if we can demonstrate that practically. And this is rather fun. We're going to do it with sound. So what I'm going to do is take two sources of sound waves. So I'm going to draw here two loudspeakers. So there's the first loudspeaker. And here is the second one, separated by a distance. And they're going to produce sound waves that go off this way. OK, uh, I've tried to sort of draw a cone shape here so you can imagine the longitudinal wave being formed by a cone oscillating from left to right. Now, uh, we need a source of sound, so we need a signal generator. So I'll put my signal generator here. And we'll do it for a fixed frequency. So signal generator. Uh, 
And then the important bit um, is that uh, to make this work well, we want both loudspeakers to move out and back again, obviously at the same frequency. Uh, they will be at the same amplitude if they're both plugged into the signal generator. But we want them to move out together and back in together. We don't want them doing this. Um, it'll still work, um, but it's best to explain it with the two speakers operating in phase. So when I set this up, I'm quite careful to make sure that the positive terminal of each loudspeaker is connected to the signal generator. And uh, you'll see what we're basically doing is putting these two loudspeakers in parallel. Um, whilst I'm drawing, it's uh, just interesting that um, I often hear systems uh, where there are, there are two loudspeakers uh, where they've mistakenly wired them back to front. So one's moving forwards when the other's moving backwards. And I notice that's on some YouTube videos as well, uh, where the left and right channels are out of phase. And it sounds absolutely dreadful. And I'm amazed that people who make the films uh, don't notice that. So there's the minus. And we're going to come up here and connect into the negative of this loudspeaker as well. So if we get that right, we know that we have the same frequency, the same amplitude, um, and we have two loudspeakers uh, oscillating in phase with each other. So um, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to draw what we might get, and then I'm going to try and explain it, uh, and we'll demonstrate it practically as well. Okay, so it's good science to try and predict what's going to happen, and it is quite a surprising result. Let's look at the midpoint between these two loudspeakers. So I'm going to draw a sort of dotted line here, okay, uh, which is sort of equidistant between the two loudspeakers. Now, these loudspeakers are going to be oscillating in and out producing a longitudinal sound wave, and we've got two sources of waves. The waves are going to come out here, and uh, we won't worry too much about the shape of the wave front. It's going to be fairly semicircular, but the waves are going to overlap. Now, what's interesting is, what happens to the waves that reach this point here, for example, from each loudspeaker? Well, if we draw a line along there, to that point from that loudspeaker, and we measure that length, L, then I'm sure you're all agreed that this distance here will also be L. So um, think about what that means, that whatever wave comes out of this, think of, think of a, imagine it as peaks and troughs. I, I agree that it's um, uh, compressions and rarefactions, but imagine high pressure arriving here. Because these two are in phase and it's the same path length, there's no difference between L and L. L, and L. There's no path difference. So the two wave fronts are going to meet at that point, And if it's a peak arriving and a peak, or a trough and a trough, they're going to constructively interfere. So at this point, we're going to hear nice, loud sound. OK? Um, I'll just put a capital L there to represent um, a high amplitude. But I wonder what happens if we move our ear to somewhere like this, where we are further away from the top loudspeaker and closer to the bottom one. So we'll look at that next. So now let's look at what happens if we were to move our position to maybe here. OK. Well, we're going to get a distance to that point from this loudspeaker. And we're going to get a distance from the bottom one. Uh, but this one that I'm drawing now, you'll notice, is closer to that point. So um, I'm going to change my letters just for the sake of it. Let's make this length um, D and a bit longer. We'll deal with a bit in a second. And if we make this length D, we're now wrong, of course, because if this is D, this is going to be longer than D. And it's really interesting. What would happen if this was D plus half a wavelength longer? OK. Well, if you think about it, if this is half a wavelength longer, the wave coming from here will be half a wavelength behind. 
So if a peak arrives along this line, half a wavelength behind is a trough. And think about it the other way around. Uh, if a trough arrives from this one, half a wavelength behind will be a peak here. They'll always be out of phase. So at this point, noise cancelling, remember, the two waves will superpose, interfere with each other, and there will be no sound at all. It'll be completely quiet. And that's a special case where uh, the path difference between these two paths is a half lambda. Now, if you get the hang of this, and you do need to for A-level, you need to understand the idea of path difference. Isn't there going to be another place here where the distance from this loudspeaker is shorter than from this one, but what if the one from the top loudspeaker was exactly a wavelength longer? Well, then they'll be back in phase again. So you'll hear a loud sound. And then there'll be another place where they're out of phase, and it'll be quiet. And I hope you can see that this is the midpoint, so you'll get the same this way, a place where the path difference between that and that is half lambda, and then a place where it's lambda. So they're back in phase again. And we can continue those places all the way along this line. Um, so just to summarize, when the path lengths are um, equal, okay, or differ by one, two, three, four wavelengths, you'll get a peak plus a peak, and that's going to equal constructive interference. And here, you're out by half a wavelength, so you're gonna get a peak arriving with a trough, and that will equal destructive interference, and it will be completely quiet. So just to make this a bit clearer, I've drawn another quick diagram. Um, imagine two wave sources here. I've got the waves going off in all directions. Okay, so it could be two loudspeakers. That would be more sound moving in this direction, like we've got up there. It could be t uh, looking down on a lake and two dippers dipping in the pond. Um, or it could actually be two laser beams traveling through space. Okay, but you'll notice that uh, these dippers uh, these loudspeakers, um, the photons, are in phase with each other. And if you look at the midpoint here, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, a trough arrives there. And because this path length is the same, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, a trough arrives here as well. So in a minute, uh, those two, or a minute, probably a microsecond or a millisecond, these two peaks are going to arrive, then two troughs, then two peaks. So of course, They'll always be in phase, they will always add up, and at that point we will get constructive interference, which lets itself be known by that place always being loud or always being bright if it's light beams. So for the sake of completeness, I've redrawn this diagram and I'm showing the same dippers uh, they're operating in phase, so this one's producing a peak as this one's just producing a peak. And those waves are going to travel, but because we've moved down from the centre line, this distance is slightly longer. And I hope you can see that I've tried to make this path half a wavelength longer. So there's half a wavelength path difference, which means when this bottom wave arrives with a peak, this top one will arrive with a trough. And then later on, it'll be a trough from the bottom one and a peak from the top one. So even though the dippers are in phase or the, um, the uh, photons of light that are traveling are in phase, they're gonna arrive here always out of phase because there's a half wavelength path difference. So we'll always get destructive interference. And at that point, it will be quiet if it's sound and it will be dark if it's light rays.
So let's see if we can demonstrate interference of waves in the laboratory. And we're going to use sound waves. So um, I've got my signal generator here that will produce a fixed frequency signal. And I'm feeding it into two loudspeakers, but I've been very careful to make sure that the positive of this loudspeaker is connected to the positive of that loudspeaker and connected to the signal generator. And the same is true of the negatives. So these two speakers are going to operate in phase. So they're going to be in phase and they're also going to be producing sound of the same frequency. So we'll turn it on and see what we get. So let's turn on the signal generator and we'll get a really annoying high pitched sound. OK, there it is. I think that's four kilohertz if I read it correctly. And um, I'm not sure what you can hear, whether you can just hear a constant sound and whether you hear any difference. as I walk about, okay, because I've got a radio microphone um, on my tie, and whether you can hear the sound getting louder and quieter, whether you could hear the places where it's interfering constructively and destructively. I'll just turn that off for a second. Okay, um, so what I'll do now is I'll take the microphone off my tie and I'll move it between the loudspeakers and see if you can hear the places where you get constructive and destructive interference. So you should hear it going loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud, quiet, as we go over each one of those places. So I think that worked quite nicely and you could hear the places where you got constructive and destructive interference. Just to make a point, by the way, you might say, oh, well, it's going to be loud in front of this loudspeaker and loud in front of that one. So you're bound to get two places that sound loud. No, because if you remember, you might see on the video as I move to the midpoint, I go through a place where it goes quiet and then at the midpoint it goes loud again. So all the way along here, the waves have the same path length. There's no path difference. So all the way along here, they will constructively interfere and we will get loud sound. So let's take this a little bit further and look at interference in a little bit more detail. So what I'd like you to imagine is drops of water. So this could be uh, a puddle or a lake and it could be rain dropping gently or droplets of water um, on the puddle. So what you'll see here, of course, is you'll see the point that the uh, water droplet hits the water surface. And as time goes on, you'll get circular waves going out from that point. OK, I'm done too badly there. Now. Um, remember this business about the phase relationship between um, any two oscillators. You're going to get a drop of water there, then you might have a pause, then you might get a drop of water here, uh, then you might get a big gap, and then three drops, etc. So there's no constant phase relationship or even position relationship between when the drops hit the water. Uh, and that's an interesting point. So it'll be like drop, drop, then none, then maybe three. So when these waves travel outwards and overlap, um, there's no fixed phase relationship between them. OK, there is a random phase relationship. Now, this is going to make it all very difficult. So you're not going to get um, a sort of stable pattern on here. Do you remember our uh, loud and quiet places where you always got constructive or you always got destructive interference? Because you don't know anything about the waves that are going to come there next. There could be another drop and extra waves appear. So um, this is a complex arrangement, 
where you get no stable um, pattern, and we call that an interference pattern. So, um, how can we solve that problem and make it a little bit more manageable, a little bit easier to understand? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to do this in a ripple tank. And you might remember what a ripple tank is. Um, it's basically a tank of water, um, like a puddle, and we can either drop water into it or we can get uh, a little motor with little sticks on it, little dippers to go dip, 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 dip. And if there's two of them tied to the motor on a bar, they're going to go in in phase. And if they're in phase, then we know when the drops are going to form. The waves are going to have a constant phase relationship and we're going to get a stable interference pattern that we can interpret and look at mathematically. So let's head off into the lab now and I'll show you the ripple tank. And what I'm going to do first is show you what happens with random drops and it's all a bit mixed up and difficult to interpret. And then what we'll do is we'll make sure that both dippers, both drops fall at the same time and in phase at a constant frequency. And then you'll see the interesting interference pattern that that generates. OK, so here's the ripple tank and it's quite a nice little device. Uh, it consists of a tank of water up here, which we can create uh, ripples in. And then uh, there's a light above, which we'll turn on in a minute, and a 45 degree mirror that uh, projects uh, the image of the ripples um, onto a screen down here. Now, at the moment, it's picking up the lights from the laboratory. Um, so what we'll do is we'll turn off the lights and we'll switch on the light on top and I'll show you some ripples in the ripple tank. Um, just a word of warning, though, um, this light strobes um, and it's not strobing at the frequencies that usually set off um, epileptic fits, uh, but I do need to warn you that it is a strobing light, so there will be some flashing. OK, so I've put the uh, camera on the front screen of the ripple tank. I'm going to turn the light on. It will flash a little bit. And uh, I'm going to create some ripples, just like the ones you'd see in a lake. So you can see circular ripples travelling outwards there. Um, but what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to sort of dip in with two fingers um, at varying phases between them. So they're not in phase, they're just sort of randomly uh, phased, just like water droplets of rain falling into a lake. So you get some nice circular ripples and they do overlap and they do interfere with each other, but you don't get a fixed and clear pattern because of the random nature of the ripples formation. In other words, the drops are going in at not constant phase relationships between them. So what I'm going to do in a minute is I'm going to change things. So when I dip into the tank, I dip in with two dippers or two raindrops that are falling, you could imagine, which have a constant phase relationship. In fact, they're going to be in phase with each other. So they're both going to dip in at the same time. And if we do that, we should get a pattern that is much easier to interpret. So I'm going to turn on the ripple tank again now and we'll get our flashing light. And the strobing light has the effect of freezing the image of the waves traveling across the screen. And then I'm going to plug in a motor with two dippers. So you can see here, it's as if I'm dropping water down on those points um, with a zero phase angle. In other words, they're in phase. So it goes drop, 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 obviously more rapidly. I think it's 40 times a second, 40 hertz. But because these two um, drops are going into the water and out of the water at the same time in phase, we get a fixed interference pattern. It's really rather nice. Now, it's a bit difficult to interpret on camera, um, but you might be able to see there are places all the way along here where there doesn't seem to be a ripple shape at all. OK, and those places are where you get destructive interference where a peak from one dipper arrives at the same time as a trough from the other one. And then there are places on here where we get maximum uh, amplitude, maximum wave shape, and that's where a peak from one arrives at the same time as a peak from the other, or a trough from one arrives at the same time as a trough from another. 
So what you're seeing here is a really nice interference pattern. It's the overlapping and summing of two progressive wave fronts to make this interference pattern. And the ripple tank demonstrates it really nicely. Good, so I hope you enjoyed the ripple tank demo and understood that. And I'd like you to remember what I did at the beginning, the sort of random drops and the complicated uh, patterns that we got that we couldn't really interpret. So what we did then was we had the two dippers going in and out at a constant phase relationship between them. In other words, they were both zero degrees out of phase. In other words, they were in phase. And uh, what we're talking about there is the concept of coherence and this is an idea you need to understand for a level that to get an interference pattern that's stable one that we can look at for ages and we can take measurements off you've got to have coherent wave sources okay so um, to get coherent wave sources to get your stable pattern okay you must have the wave sources must have a constant phase relationship. So uh, often you get questions on this and it sort of says, um, either asks you what you need to make it work and why it doesn't work with some uh, wave sources. And we'll look at that in a second. Uh, but they might ask you, what do we mean by coherent wave sources? Okay, so what it means is there's a phase relationship between the two sources uh, and there can be a difference, is, for example, there can be a difference of um, no degrees. Okay, so they're in phase. They could be all out by 180 degrees. Okay, or pi radians. So they're out of phase but they're always exactly that much out of phase. So there's a constant phase relationship. So we're okay, they're coherent. Um, there are other angles as well that they can be out of phase, um, but I won't deal with those in detail. But what about this one? 360 degrees or two pi, okay? Well, that's where you start one dipper and as it comes back up, the next one comes and joins it. So fundamentally, they're in phase. So. Looking at that, um, we need to explain, well, I've just mentioned what sources are in, uh, are coherent, but I need to talk to you about sources that this isn't gonna work for, sources that we can describe as being incoherent. I rather like that word. So here we go for wave sources that are, perhaps I should say not coherent or non-coherent. I think incoherent is probably uh, not a very physics-y word. So something to note. Uh, imagine a light bulb. Now, you might think, well, hang on, everything you've taught me today, FJ, um, suggests that if I have two lights in my room, I can walk around and I'll find light and dark patches. And the answer is, no, you don't. Okay, so what's going on there? Well, if I draw the light bulb, I'll draw a sort of old-fashioned light bulb, like that with its filament in it, Okay, um, I don't want to get into this uh, uh, too complicated, but a light bulb has atoms that are hot, okay? Uh, those atoms have promoted electrons because they're hot. The electrons fall down and release a photon for each drop, each um, falling from a higher shell to a lower shell. But they don't all go, we'll all drop at once, okay? They go, I'll drop, then maybe another one, then an atom that's further away. Can you see this is a random process and also there are different path lengths there. So in other words, you get a photon coming off and then maybe another photon and then maybe one there. Okay, um, unless I've made a terrible mistake drawing this, those photons all traveling in that direction, shall we say, have a random phase relationship. There's no connection really between one atom and another atom and when they let out their photon of light. So there's a random phase relationship. 
So if you think about that in a little bit of detail, you'll think, well, OK, you will get interference when a uh, peak and a trough uh, arrive, but then it might be two peaks arrive. OK, so you won't get a stable interference pattern. However, um, it is possible, um, not that difficult, to produce light sources that are coherent, and we'll look at those next. So it is possible to produce um, coherent lights, um, two beams of coherent light from a light bulb, um, but we don't do that anymore. Uh, back in the day, we used to do it by really narrowing down, so we kind of only let through one photon stream, but even that's an, not very well explained. So forget light bulbs, uh, they are non-coherent light sources. But the most wonderful invention, the laser. So if we take um, a laser, um, a laser is a fairly complicated device, but there's something very special about the way it works. Okay. Um, laser stands for something. So it's light amplification, brighter light, by stimulated, um, stimulated, I'll explain in a second, emission of radiation. Okay, that's where the name laser comes from. And I'm going to brush over this very quickly, but what you do is you create in the laser an inverted population. In other words, you create uh, atoms where all the electrons are in a higher orbital. They shouldn't be there. Okay, and then you you uh, cause them all to fall at the same time. Vroomf. Now you might say, but what about the atoms that are further away? It's really clever. The way it works is that photons are released, then those photons travel along, release the next ones, travel along, help release the next ones, stimulated emission. Okay, Massively oversimplified, FJ, but what it means is that every photon that comes out of the laser will have a constant phase relationship with every other one. Okay which means that the laser is brilliant at being used to show uh, interference patterns that are stable because we have a constant phase relationship between the photons that are produced. It's a very clever device. Okay, so uh, teachers that want to demonstrate uh, interference with um, lasers, and it's something you, or should I say with light, and it's something you really have to see, you're going to go for a laser every time. Um, now, it's going to be tricky to do it with two lasers, because unless they're connected together and there's some complicated physics going on, you can't make the two lasers produce photons at exactly the same time. So what you do is you take a single laser and you pass it through fairly wide slits. OK, so I um, hadn't intended to show this today, but let's do it anyway. Uh, if I block off there and here, I'm making these slits wide, yeah, so we don't get huge diffraction effects. OK, can you see now I've kind of beam split? OK, and that will allow me to work with this beam and that one. OK, again, I've simplified, but can you see how we've created two coherent light beams there? OK, so let's have a closer look at the ripple tank demonstration. And I've drawn um, a picture of the circular ripples coming off the two dippers. Uh, yeah, not brilliant, I'm sorry, it's not easy for me to do. These all should be, uh, they're in phase, and they should all be a constant wavelength because they were both at the same frequency. But it'll still make my point. Uh, there are some places that um, I'd like to look at. Okay. Uh, for example, one, two, three, one, two, three. So here, that point, you'll notice, has a path difference. of zero. Okay, so we know those two waves are in phase at that point. Okay, the phase angle is zero, so you will get constructive interference there. Okay, I suppose I can say that phi between them is equal to zero degrees. Now, let's pick some other places. So, um, what about here? What about that position? Okay, well, I think you can see 
Uh, we've got one wave uh, from this one, and from this one we've got one, two, three waves. Okay, so uh, there's an equal number of wavelengths there. So one wave from this one and three from the other. So we've got a path difference here. Equal to two wavelengths, and therefore the phase angle between them is still zero degrees. Okay, um, so it's a peak and a peak arriving, then a trough and a trough arriving. So these two uh, situations here, as you know, are perfectly set up for constructive interference. But now I've added another dot to my diagram. Look at this place here. Now, I think you've probably got a good idea of what's going on now. Bottom one, one, two, three waves. The top one, one, two, oh, three, oh, two and a half. So here we've got a path difference. But the path difference is half a wavelength. Should we call it lambda over two? That's a better way of doing it, okay? And if we've got a path difference of lambda over two, you can see that maybe we've got a peak from uh, the bottom one and a trough from the top one, and then it's gonna be a peak from the top one and a trough from the bottom, etc. okay? Half a wavelength out of phase, so uh, the phase angle here, phi, is pi or 180 degrees. And I hope you're aware now that that is exactly what we need for destructive interference. And because these two are in phase, uh, they're at the same frequency, they're not moving further apart, everything stays the same. Um, it's difficult to see on a stationary diagram, but that point will always have a phase difference of 180 degrees. Yeah, there's a constant phase difference. They're coherent sources. So at this point, there will never ever be any wave amplitude. You will always get destructive interference. So finally on this bit, let's look at what we need to create constructive interference and then destructive interference. So for constructive interference, I think you've probably worked it out by now, okay? There's got to be uh, no path difference, okay? Or lambda, two lambda, three lambda, etc. okay? Dot, 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 n lambda. So if that is the path difference, then the waves will always arrive in phase, okay? They will always add up and you'll always get constructive interference. But let's now look at destructive interference. And you have to think a bit harder about this one. So for destructive interference, you remember you've got to be out by half a wavelength, yep, or one and a half, etc. And what you'll notice is that it's always a number of wavelengths plus that extra half. So there we go. That would be the setup always for destructive interference. Okay, so here's a diagram I prepared earlier because it's an absolute nightmare to draw on clear acetate film. Um, but we need to get a little bit more technical about um, where we see constructive and destructive interference on a uh, pattern that's produced by two in-phase um, oscillators. 
So we've got a stable interference pattern that we saw on the ripple tank. And if you look at the midpoint here and you follow along um, the midpoint, you'll notice uh, peak and peak, trough and trough, okay? Peak and peak, trough and trough, peak and peak. All the way along this line, you will always, looking that way, get place where you get constructive interference, okay? And we call that place the central maxima, okay? It has an order of zero, the zero order maxima, okay? And this next bit is really important for later on. Uh, not so much in this video, but later on in your course. If we turn through a slight angle, okay? And what we typically do is put a screen here. So if these were coherent light sources, a laser, okay, split into two beams, you'd get a light ray hitting, you, sorry, you'd get the addition of the light rays hitting here, always in phase, you'd get a bright spot. But if you move down the screen slightly, follow this line along, okay? There's the red peak and the trough of the blue. There's the blue peak and the trough of the red. There's the red peak and the trough of the blue, etc. So all the way along this line, the waves are always out of phase. And that's going to produce um, a minima, no light, no sound, okay? And we refer to that as the first one we come to as we turn through an angle from the horizontal, the first order minima. And it's destructive interference, of course, where there's a path difference of half lambda or we are pi radians out of phase. Now, let's turn from the zero central order maxima through the first order minima to the next place where we get brightness or sound. And look again, I'll do it quickly, peak and a peak, trough and a trough, peak and a peak, uh, trough and a trough, and there would be here a peak and a peak. So all the way along this line, following it back to any screen that you put, you would get sound, or if it's a screen, you get a bright spot of laser light, okay? And that bright spot is not the laser, it's the superposition of two uh, coherent waves from the laser. And because that's the first one we come to from the horizontal, that's called the first order maxima. And it's where the path difference is lambda or two pi radians out of phase, 360 degrees out of phase. Now I can keep going on and doing this, but if we turn through another angle, we'll get another place where we've got peak and trough, peak and trough, and with the red uh, wave front there, that would be peak and trough. Uh, Obviously, these are both red light sources. I'm just using colours. The laser would probably be red. Colours to demonstrate the two wave fronts, OK? Uh, but obviously, they wouldn't be the same wavelength if they were different colours of light. It's just a drawing technique. Be warned for that one. All the way along here, out of phase, OK? We've gone through the central order maxima, first order minima, right again, dark or silent, all the way along this line. That's the second order minima, OK, and you've got one and a half wavelengths phase difference. OK, so you can think of that as two pi plus another pi, three pi, as it were. And um, you will get another second order maxima, third order maxima, fourth. And later on, we'll look at, not in this video, but later on, we'll look at do we get five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's, you can probably see there's a point where you will run out of uh, first, second, Third, you'll run out of maxima, okay? And quite often at A-level, comes later, you're asked to calculate how many you get. Be careful, okay? Because I've only gone down from the central order maxima. The whole process is the same on the top. There will be above here another minima, then a first order maxima, then a minima, then a second order maxima. So if you need to know how many maxima there are, you're going to have to count how many are here, how many are there, the same number, and don't forget the central one as well. OK, so let's end this video by looking at one really special case of interference. And it's called thin film interference, and it has lots of applications. And I'll try not to go on and on about what those are. Um, I'm going to massively simplify this, OK? Uh, it is rather more complicated than I'm letting on, but I want you to get the idea, OK? So um, you've all seen um, oil slicks on the road, and you see those wonderful colours, OK? It's the same physics that applies when you blow bubbles, and the bubbles get very, very thin 
and you start to see lots of lovely colours. But if you look closely, on a bubble, the colours seem to move as the thickness of the bubble changes. And on the road, you get different colours on the oil slick, and that depends on the thickness of the oil film. So let me see if I can explain it. So um, here's the road, and the road is a non-transparent surface, so there it is. Okay. And um, this tends to work when you've got a wet day, so you've got some water on the surface of the road. So I'm magnifying this up, but there is the water layer. Okay, so this is water. Now, that's all fine until you get an oil slick on the road. So um, I'm going to draw the, um, the oil slick forming on top. I'll just use a brown pen, that doesn't really mean anything. Uh, so here's the oil. And you get some really interesting things happening. Um, the oil will spread out, and it, it sort of spreads out over the water layer because it doesn't mix with it, and it often spreads out until it's about one molecule thick. That's really quite interesting. Now, when you look down upon this layer, you see different colours of light uh, coming off the layer of oil, and it's that I want to explain next. Okay, so the first thing you've got to do to explain this is consider the light to be uh, white light from the sun. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw some red light coming in. So here's the red light coming in, penetrating the oil and reflecting off the water. Okay, that's the first bit you need to understand. Now remember that red light has a longer wavelength than blue light, and that's coming up next. But you'll also get some partial reflection off the oil layer as well. So you've got light off the oil layer and off the water layer. Now you'll notice that those uh, rays uh, might not come together, might not converge, but our eye is brilliant at bringing rays together and making them converge. So I know you're not that close etc but I'm suggesting you're looking down on the liquid okay and the other little bit of information we need to know is we'll give this um, a thickness and we'll make this layer thickness L okay we're set up ready to go so we've got our thickness of uh, layer of oil equal to L now you remember I said I'm simplifying this so bear with me okay if this is L, and this is a very, very short distance, then that's basically L. So that whole distance there in that triangle, is, if the angles are very small, it's basically 2L. Um, that's the only way we can do that today to make it easy. But what if the light coming in has a wavelength whereby this distance here for the red light, okay, is a quarter of a wavelength? Okay. Now, I think you can see what happens there. The first light reflects off, and I'm not going to get into the details of does it invert on reflection, etc. Okay, um, I am massively simplifying before anyone watches this and goes, oh, for heaven's sake, you know, I don't want to make it overly complicated. I want you to just think of the light reflecting off here, okay, and uh, remaining as it was when it came in, okay. But this light will go down and up and will join up with your eye, and will be a quarter, a half a wavelength path difference. And if that's the case, then you know what's going to happen. Those two rays are going to be out of phase by 180 degrees, and they're going to add up in your eye, destructively interfere, and the colour red is going to disappear from that part of the oil layer. So what you'll see is a different colour. You might see the blues, for example. So now let's look at what happens when we shine blue light in. OK, so let's shine some blue light in. So that blue light is going to come from the sun, and we'll do exactly the same process. So in goes the blue light, reflects off the water layer, and out it comes, and that's going to go into your eye. And you also get some reflection off the oil layer. So um, I'll draw the eye here. That's just a physicist way of saying, you know, look in that direction. Right. Now, the wavelength of blue light is much shorter. 
So what if this layer here is half a wavelength for blue light thick? OK, now think that out. Quarter of a wavelength would mean that the wavelength for red is longer. Half a wavelength means that the wavelength for blue compared to the red must be shorter. OK, now there's another way this could happen because um, you might say, well, these wavelengths don't work out for light colours when you do the maths. OK, if you, you can look at it that way, but this layer can get thinner or thicker. So um, it can get to a situation where it is exactly half a wavelength thick for blue light. Well, I think uh, you don't need me to explain it. This one will reflect. This path difference here is a half plus a half. So it's a wavelength out of phase. So those two rays are going to arrive in the eye in phase and the eye will add them together. And you will see blue light off that bit of the oil film because you've got constructive interference. So I've just put a little bit more detail on the board. Um, I've said that the wavelength of red is four times this distance, as we'd expect, if this is a quarter wavelength thick. So the path difference is there and back, 2L, and that will therefore be half a wavelength, so you'll always get destructive interference. And the blue light, which has a shorter wavelength, okay, um, its wavelength is just there and back, okay, so L, not 4L, Okay, path difference is there and back, which is 2L, which is exactly a wavelength of blue light. So you'll always get constructive interference between the top reflected ray and the lower one. Okay, uh, just a couple of points that I want to make. Um, oil films are not a constant thickness, so um, you'll get different arrangements of waves that are in phase and out of phase. But remember that the ones that are in phase, you'll see. So that's why you see specific colours, and the ones that are out of phase will be removed from that um, coloured area. Okay? Um, it's actually used, um, I said I wasn't going to talk about this for ages, but it is actually used in real situations. Um, if this was a see-through layer here, like some glass, if you look at the red light, um, this is quite a complex concept, that light coming in is out of phase with the light coming out of here, so that light um, destructively interferes and if there was a piece of glass here it means that it would all go through there would be no amplitude on this side and that would be increased transmission glass you have a thin film on the front you sometimes see it on people's glasses they look slightly purpley um, because there's a very fine thin film on the front of the glass or expensive camera lenses Anyway, um, I'm going to say it again because I know someone is going to comment that I've um, massively oversimplified and I've forgotten about certain things that happen here. But it's the concept I want you to understand. Okay? But I did a nice little YouTube video on this. Um, so if you've got some time, I'll put a link above. And why not head off and watch a short video with some uh, real photographs of oil films um, on the road that I took outside school. So I do hope you found that video useful and you feel you've got a good understanding now of uh, constructive and destructive interference and what needs to happen uh, for that to appear and to get a stable pattern and also uh, what the path differences need to be to create that interference pattern. Anyway, I'll be making another video soon and I look forward to seeing you then.